number 72. It's written on the board, written a bit small. You could write a bit bigger, whoever writes a verse on the board. Remember, people have to sit a bit farther away. You write so small, difficult to see. Esha Brahmi Siti Parta Esha Brahmi Siti Parta Esha Brahmi Siti Parta Esha Brahmi Siti Parta Nainam Prabhya Vimuchyati Nainam Prabhya Vimuchyati Nainam Prabhya Vimuchyati Nainam Prabhya Vimuchyati Stit Vashyam Antakalepi
Tetva, Tetva, being situated, being situated, Ashyam, Ashyam, in this, in this, and the Kale, and the Kale, at the end, at the end of life, of life, a pea, a pea, also, also, Brahma Nirvanam, the spiritual kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom of God, Richati, one attains. Translation, that is the way of the spiritual and godly life, after attaining which a man is not bewildered. If one is thus situated, even at the hour of death, one can enter into the kingdom of God. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. One can attain Krishna consciousness or divine life at once within a second, or one may not attain such a state of life, even after millions of births. It is only a matter of understanding and accepting the fact. Gatvanga Maharaj attained this state of life just a few minutes before his death by surrendering unto Krishna. Nirvana means ending the process of materialistic life. According to Buddhist philosophy, there is only void after the completion of this material life. But Bhagavad Gita teaches differently. Actual life begins after the completion of this material life. For the gross materialist, it is sufficient to know that one has to end this materialistic way of life. But for persons who are spiritually advanced, there is another life after this materialistic life. Be before ending this life, if one fortunately becomes Krishna conscious, he at once attains the stage of Brahma Nirvana. There is no difference between the kingdom of God and the devotional service of the Lord, since both of them are on the absolute plane to be engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord is to have attained the spiritual kingdom. In the material world, there are activities of sense gratification, whereas in the spiritual world there are activities of Krishna consciousness. Attainment of Krishna consciousness, even during this life, is immediate attainment of Brahman. And one who is situated in Krishna consciousness <coughs> has certainly already entered into the kingdom of God. Brahman is just the opposite of matter. Therefore, Brahmi Stiti means not on the platform of material activities. Devotional service of the Lord is accepted in the Bhagavad Gita as the liberated state. Sagunam samatityaikam brahma bhuyaya kalpate. Therefore, brahmistiti means, brahmistiti is liberation from material bondage. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur has summarized the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita as being the contents of for the whole text. In the Bhagavad Gita, the subject matters are Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. In the second chapter, Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga have been clearly discussed, and a glimpse of Bhakti Yoga has also been given as the contents for the complete text. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purports to the second chapter of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita in the matter of its contents.
Om Ajnana Timurandasya Gyanan Jana Shalakaya Jatsur Militamina Tasma Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha Kaupata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Vallevacha Patita Nam Paman Devyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Nama Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hatvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadri Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So, so this is the, the last verse of this chapter and you can see it's like a summary of the whole chapter. Just like this chapter is also called Contents of the Gita Summarized. So the second chapter contains different topics. Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga and a little tiny glimpse of Bhakti Yoga. But uh, so, uh, Lord Krishna is concluding this chapter by giving a summary and he's telling us qualification to go back to Godhead, back to the spiritual world. And Srila Prabhupada points out that if you're engaged in devotional service, then you're already back to Godhead. You don't have to wait for death to give up the body to go back to Godhead. If you're engaging in full devotional service with body, mind and words, then you're already back to Godhead. It is stated in the scriptures like that. There's a verse. Iha yasya hare dashi karmana manasadira nikilas pabiya vastastu jivan mukta sauchati that one who is engaged with his body, mind and words in the service of the Supreme Lord, then he is a Jivan Mukta, he is a liberated soul. In other words, he's not in this material world. He's already transcended the material energy. So that is coming, that is the meaning of Brahmastiti being fixed on the platform of Brahman. And, and of course the verse ends nir, nirvana richati nirvana, and Prabhupada translates nirvana as the kingdom of God. <laughs> of course that's quite different from how the Buddhist people will explain nirvana because in Buddhism they have the idea, they give the concept that they, the absolute truth is zero that ultimately nothing is real <laughs> right they say, brahman satyam brahman <laughs> brahman uh, they, they say the body is illusion and the, the 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 spirit is also nothing is real they, they will only speak about the void right? they're not going to speak about god they don't believe in God. Who is Buddha? Buddha is not God. Buddha is Buddha, they would say. So they won't speak about God and they will simply speak about the void, the nothing. And they'll tell you that nothing is real. And so we say, actually we say, well, the material world, this material world, it is real but it is temporary. It's temporary. We know that material creation is created, it exists for some time, and then it's annihilated, then it comes to an end. So that is the nature of the ma ma matter. But spirit, that is eternal. So Shankaracharya, who was defeated the Buddhist philosophy, it was Shankaracharya who drove the Buddhist philosophy out of India, he preached Brahman Satyam Jagat Nitya. He preached that the world, material world is false, but the Brahman is real. But for the Buddhists, they don't believe in any Brahman. They simply 
believe in the nothingness. Although some people do talk about the soul, but generally there's different understandings. And the Buddhists will talk that the soul can also be annihilated. Well, we don't agree with that. We explain that the soul is eternal. So we have to understand these things in relation to the Vedic philosophy. So many other people may speak so many things, but we want to know where does it say this in the Vedas? Where does it say this in our scriptures? We follow the Vedic tradition. We don't just follow the speculations of some monk. We want to hear from the Lord himself. And the Vedas are that. The Vedas are aparushya. They come from a divine person. They don't come from an ordinary person. An ordinary person is a conditioned soul. They have defects. They make mistakes. Subject to illusion. Propensity to cheat. Imperfect senses. This is the problem of conditioned life. But if we hear from the divine source, from that source which is aparushya, not an ordinary person, then that is perfect knowledge. That is the knowledge which we take from the Vedic literature. You hear from the scriptures, just like we're reading Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita means the song of Bhagavan. And who is Bhagavan? That is Lord Sri Krishna. One person told me they were going to the Buddhist temple and they were hearing the scriptures in the Buddhist temple and they were always talking about Bhutya Fan, Bhutya Fan. And he was wondering who is that Bhutya Fan? And then he came across the Bhagavad Gita. Bhutya Fan Go. And in Chinese it's called Bhutya Fan Go. So he'd been hearing Bhutya Fan. He didn't know who was that Bhagavan. Then he heard the Bhagavad Gita. So he could understand, oh, this is the words of Bhagavan. So this is Bhagavad Gita. That's why it's so important. It's so famous all over the world. Everyone respects Bhagavad Gita. It's the words of God himself. So there are no defects. There's no mistakes. If you look at your science books or your economic books, whatever books you have, you'll see that the different theories and knowledge which is presented there, it, it gets out of date and they have to revise it. They have to edit it. They have to update it. The science books, chemistry, physics, all this stuff, biology, you know, they're always having to edit things and change things. They were explaining, in physics they were explaining first of all everything in terms of corpuscles. Corpuscles, the corpuscular theory. That everything is corpuscle. And then after the corpuscle theory, then they came up with the wave motion. And they explained everything in terms of the waves. Then after the wave theory, then they came up with the quantum theory the different energy levels, the quantums. But still they haven't got everything explained. They're still short trying to explain the nature of life and matter and the world. They're always trying, but they're always short. They never can give a perfect explanation. They can explain a little bit, and then a little bit more, a little bit more. Just like Mother Yashoda was trying to tie up Krishna and when she was bringing the ropes, the ropes were always too short. And then finally it was only when Krishna allowed her that Mother Yashoda was able to tie up Krishna. So the same way material scientists and philosophers, they're trying to explain the world to us, but they're always too short. They never, they can never perfectly explain everything in this world. Because if we want to understand everything in this world, we have to hear, we have to take knowledge from the Supreme Source. And the perfect source is that person from whom everything comes. 
So that is Lord Sri Krishna, as described by Lord Brahma himself in his Brahma Samhita, that Lord Krishna is a Ishvara Parama Krishna, Satchit Ananda Vigraha, Anadir Adir Govinda Sarva Karana Karanam. That Lord Krishna is the cause of all causes and the origin of all origins. So everything has some origin and the ultimate origin of everything is Lord Sri Krishna. He is the original cause behind everything. We have to take knowledge from him. And Krishna is so kind, he comes and he speaks this Bhagavad Gita and he's teaching us how we can understand him. We have to hear Bhagavad Gita. So Lord Krishna is explaining that the actual nature of the living entity is not matter, but it is spirit. It is actually Brahman. We are all spiritual beings, but we identify with the material world. We identify with the material body and we think of this body as being senses and we think the goal of life is to enjoy the senses. And we are thinking we're going to get happiness from the sense objects. But in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna tells us, no, that's not true. The sense objects are simply going to bring you misery. They're just going to bring you suffering. So if you become a, a goddas, if you become a servant of the senses, then you're going to suffer. You're going to have a hard time in this world. We have to learn how to control the senses. We are living in the material body. This body is simply material energy. And we are thinking, this is our city. Just like you live here in this city, you live here in Butterworth, and you think, you, you, Butterworth is for my enjoyment. You know, how much can you enjoy in the Butterworth, you know? What belongs to us? There's a whole city, but can you enjoy it? Of course, it's not ours to enjoy. It belongs to so many other people. So similarly, we are living in this body, but this body doesn't really belong to us. Just like you have a mother and father, so you can say, well, the body belongs to them. It's the property of the mother. She gives birth. Father will say, no, I'm the one who can see. I, I put the, child, the, the, the sperm into the womb of my wife, and this way she had a baby, so it's my child. So the, you know, father and mother, they're both claiming proprietorship of the child. And then the nation also claims proprietorship. You're born in our country. You're a Malaysian. You have to act on behalf of the nation. Just like, you know, they had that war, Russia and Ukraine. So all the Ukrainian men, they all had to go to war. They were supposed to go, you know, they, they wanted all the men go and fight. And all the Russian men also, you're Russian, you have to go and fight. People, they didn't want to do it. Just like when America was fighting Vietnam, so many young men, I don't want to go to Vietnam, you know, I'm not going to go there and fight. But America, because you're born in America, they were arresting you. If you didn't go, they'd arrest you and take you and force you to go. So, Different people claim proprietorship over the body. Maybe you belong to a community. I'm, oh, I'm a Hindu, or I'm a, I'm a Tamil, or I'm a Chinese, or whatever. We belong to different communities. And the community claims proprietorship. But who does the body actually belong to? Well, the body is born from the earth. It belongs to the earth comes from the air. Even we see people fighting over the earth. Who is the proprietor? This is my land. No, this land belongs to me. And people are fighting over the land. 
claiming proprietorship. And Mother Earth, Bumi, who is the personification of the deity of the Earth planet, she just simply laughs at these foolish people. She laughs to see them fight and kill each other. The land was there before they were born and it will be there after they die also. The land will remain. So who does the land actually belong to? Where did the land come from? This has to be understood. Who is actually the proprietor of everything? Of course, in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna will explain later on in the fifth chapter, at the end of the fifth chapter, Lord Krishna will give the peace formula, what is known, what the Prabhupada calls the, the peace formula. A formula by which one can achieve peace. People want peace, they're always calling out, we want peace, we don't want war, we want peace. And they would have peace marches, and they would have peace protests, like that. We want to ban the bomb and all of these things. It used to go on. When I was a schoolboy, we used to also protest, ban the bomb, we want peace. And people are still protesting, still trying to get peace and still there is no peace in the world. So Lord Krishna gives a formula for peace and that formula requires that we have to understand who is actually the proprietor of everything. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says that one who knows uh, who is actually the proprietor, Bhaktaram Yagna Tapasham, Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. Maheshwaram. The name Maheshwar. It's a name. There's people from, you know, Rajasthan, Mar Marwari, something, the Indian community from Rajasthan, Rajasthani people, they have that name Maheshwar. Yeah. So, Lord Krishna uses that word in Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. Maheshwaram meaning the proprietor of everything. All the planets, not just everything on this planet, but Sarva Loka Maheshwaram, the proprietor of all the planets. So you have to recognize who is that person, who is the proprietor of everything. And Bhaktaram Yagna Tapasham, who is actually the enjoyer of all yagnas and tapaspas, all austerities and penances. So that person is the one who can help us to get peace. We have to know who is the enjoyer of all penances and austerity, who is the proprietor of all the planets, and who is Suri Dham Sarva Bhutanam, the best friend of all living entities. So when we know these kind of things, when we know who is actually the best friend of everyone, along with the other two things, then you become qualified for peace. Then you get peace. And peace means to become Krishna conscious. Just like here, Prabhupada is explaining that this nirvana is not, it's not just the elimination of matter, but it's entering into the spiritual existence. To just destroy matter, that is not going to help. You have to replace the matter with spirit. When you have spiritual energy, when you have spiritual life and a spiritual world, then you will find perfect peace, perfect existence in the spiritual realm, not in this material world. Of course, if you're engaged in devotional service, then that is as good as the spiritual world. 
because one who is engaged in the service of Krishna, they have brought matter into transcendence. They have transformed the material energy into spiritual energy. How is it possible? It is possible by the inconceivable potency of Lord Krishna. Because Lord Krishna is the proprietor of everything. So if he wants, he can transform matter into spirit. He can do everything. We are just required to surrender to him. So when we actually surrender and take shelter of Lord Krishna, then we have to utilize the material energy for Krishna's service. How to use everything in Krishna's service will be told to us by reading Bhagavad Gita and by hearing from sadhus and, and gurus. When we hear from the spiritual teachers, they will enlighten us how to utilize everything in Krishna's service. Out of ignorance, sometimes people want to give up material things. People think, oh, this is maya. Just like some people, they say, I will not see any woman. I will go to Himalayas. I will not see any woman, because woman is maya. So woman is a form of maya. So some men, they think like that, and they will go to Himalaya. But that's not necessary. If one sees Krishna in all women, if one sees that they are also part and parcel of Krishna, then they will, the, the, the one who is in knowledge, he will want to engage them also in Krishna's service. He will not just see them as agents of Maya. He will not see them as any kind of problem or enemy. But he will see that they are also Krishna's energy. And they also have a right to be engaged in Krishna's service. And so they will think, how to do that? How to engage? The, the, the ladies in the service of Krishna. Just like the men chant Hare Krishna, so ladies can also chant Hare Krishna. I was noticing yesterday there was a billboard and they were advertising they are going to have walking on fire, right? <laughs> Tomorrow, fire walking, yeah. You have to walk on the hot coals. So I asked, do the ladies also do that? No, no, ladies, they don't do that. So, that kind of thing ladies cannot do. But service to Krishna, ladies can do. Chanting Hare Krishna can be done by everyone. Everyone can chant Hare Krishna. Everyone can be devotee of Krishna. And they can also achieve perfection. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Stri o Vaishya stata sudras tepi yanti paramgatim. Mamhi parta vaya pashritya yeti shu papa yonaya. Stri o Vaishya stata sudras Lord Krishna is saying that uh, even a person may be of lower birth, like women and Sudra and Vaishya, birth is lower, they're not Brahmanas, but they can also attain the supreme destination. They can also go to the spiritual world. They can also become fully Krishna conscious. One Buddhist monk was asking me, he, the, the, I know this one Buddhist monk, he is a very nice man. He helped me do some preaching in China one time. So he, he asked me, he said, you know, he said, in your spiritual world, in the land of Krishna, 
He said, are there any women there? <laughs> because in Buddhism, there's no men and there's no women. There's only Buddha. Everyone becomes a Buddha. <laughs> See, that is, a, that is their impersonalism, the oneness that everyone becomes a Buddha. Whether you're a man or a woman, you become a Buddha. So there's no man and no woman. So it's in the, he asked, in, in the spirit, in Krishna's land, do you have women as well as men? I said, oh yes, ladies are also there. There are gopis, right? There are wonderful devotees there in the spiritual world. The gopis are there. And Krishna's wives are there also. And there are so many other ladies also who are also devotees, pure devotees of the Lord. And so he was surprised. He said, well, well doesn't that create a problem? Because usually men and women, you know, men and women together can be a problem. But I said, no, no problem. Because they're all so pure-hearted. They don't make distinction based on the body. They see everyone as a spiritual being, a spirit soul, part and parcel of Lord Krishna. In other words, there's no sex desire there in the spiritual world. So that is the difference, you see? So he was, wow, oh, oh, very interesting. <laughs> so we have to understand the nature of sp spirituality. Here we are living in the material world, we're in material bodies, but we're all spiritual beings. We're all eternally part and parcel of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is the master and we are all the servant. We are all his servants. And we are all engaging in Krishna's service in many different ways for the pleasure of Krishna. So there is variety in the spiritual world. It's not that there's only the Buddha, there's only the oneness, but there is variety. And that variety allows for enjoyment because Lord Krishna is the supreme enjoyer. And he enjoys in many various different ways. And our purpose is to give pleasure to Krishna by rendering service to him. So we're, we're doing things like today we have Snan Yatra, we have the birthday of Lord Jagannath, it's an opportunity also for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. The Lord Krishna will enjoy the devotees all coming and bathing him. And Lord Krishna will perform also his pastimes. His pastime, he will he become sick for some time. And in this way, we will lose his presence. He won't come, we won't be able to have darshan for 14 days, 15 days. So this is all Leela. Lord Krishna enjoys his Leela and he enjoys this Leela with his devotees. In the association of his devotees, he's giving pleasure. And we get pleasure out of giving service to Krishna. When we see Krishna enjoying, we also feel pleasure because we are all part and parcel of Krishna. We have that relationship with the Lord.
So by serving Krishna, we actually do good. We bring auspiciousness to the whole planet and everyone benefits. And Prabhupada, <coughs> Prabhupada writes in the Nectar of Devotion how Krishna consciousness is the ultimate auspicious activity, that the, the whole world benefits by us, our spreading Krishna consciousness. It's not something we're doing just for our own benefit. Like some people, you know, for their own benefit, they go away from the world, they don't want to see any women, they just want to go and hide in the cave, and they, that's all for their own benefit. But the devotees thinking about benefiting others, how to give to others, how to give Krishna consciousness to everyone. All right, so we will stop here, ask if there's any question, any comment, anything? Maharaj? Yes, Prabhu. It's mentioned uh, that one who uh, take up Krishna consciousness, it means that he has already studied all the scriptures, performed all the yagyas, and performed all the austerities, and therefore, you know, he comes to Krishna consciousness. But then we will see that sometimes it's supposed to be like this, but then there are, we see devotees who are practicing, it doesn't seem that they have performed all austerity or all yagyas or read all the scriptures. So how do we reconcile that on one hand, a person who comes to Krishna consciousness, He's supposed to study and do all these things. At the same time, when we see there are, you know, we have Bhakti Shastri, we have all this. So, how do we control in the sense that where does one stand when it comes to Krishna consciousness? Well, we have to appreciate someone may come to Krishna consciousness, but we don't know how, how well they're practicing Krishna consciousness. And we don't know how long they're going to re remain in Krishna consciousness. People come to Krishna consciousness and they often also go away again after some time. So we can understand that, you know, they, they didn't actually do all of these things before. Because they're not steady in Krishna consciousness. But if they're faithfully and regularly maintaining the standard of Krishna consciousness, then there's some possibility that in the past they had also done some preliminary practice of Krishna consciousness. We have to we have to observe what kind of level of Krishna consciousness they're at and how long they maintain it and how strictly they practice it. Just like there's one devotee in USA, and his name is Dravida Prabhu. Dravida, he's a brahmachari. He's an, an, Amer an American body, and he's you know he knows hundreds of verses from the scriptures, and he can quote all these different verses. So, so it's, it's just amazing, you know, how he can quote so many big verses, you know, elaborate verses, and he will recite them and explain them. So, somebody said that, you know, you, you, in your past life you must have been some kind of Brahmana. He said, yeah, I must have been a very fallen Brahmana. <laughs> so like that, you know, fall, maybe a fallen Brahmana. And, then we come to Krishna consciousness. So, the scripture says, one who is uh, chanting the holy name with faith and with conviction is understood that he performed all kinds of pious activities. And he visited all the holy places and he studied all the scriptures and acquired all the good qualities of the Aryans. And now he's 
regularly chanting the holy name of the Lord. He's fixed in the chanting of the holy name of the Lord. So who is actually fixed in the chanting? You know, you have to see how much chanting they do. And what does it mean to be fixed? You know, we just chant 16 rounds, but you know, people who are supposed to chant one lakh names every day, 64 rounds every day. You know, how many people can do that? It's not a very easy thing to chant 64 rounds every day. So there are different ways of understanding that, who is actually fixed in Krishna consciousness. We struggle to chant 16 rounds. Difficult for us just to keep up that vow. So, how much we did before we came to Krishna consciousness, <laughs> we don't really know. <laughs> Not much. And Prabh Prabhupada was asked, did we come to Krishna consciousness because of our pious activities? And of course Prabhupada said, I am creating your pious activities. Practically speaking, we didn't have any pious activities before coming to Krishna consciousness. But we came, somehow we came to Prabhupada and Prabhupada engaged us in Krishna consciousness. So we started our pious activities once we contacted Srila Prabhupada. Devotion has to come from the devotee. So you have to contact the devotee. You have to have some connection with the devotee. And then you come into Krishna consciousness. Without the connection to a devotee, then it's just material piety. Not really spiritual. You may have had some good qualities, but it would be material. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Maharaj, uh, you understand that uh, a wife who do her duty faithfully, uh, she will get fifty percent of whatever the husband is doing in devotional service. What happens if the wife is a devotee, the husband is not, and the wife serves the husband faithfully? Yeah, even to the extent of maybe serving him uh, his staff, but she do her prescribed duty as a wife very faithfully. Does she get the, as a wife get a good effect of the husband, does the wife will get the bad effect of the husband also if she serve such husband? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she would. So if she's serving the husband, she's going to get some reaction. But, of course, if she herself is engaged in devotional service, then she can nullify this. Whatever she gets, she can nullify it by her devotional activity. Although it seems like, although she would be getting it, but they won't affect her because she's engaging in Krishna conscious activity. If she's faithful in her discharge of devotional service, then whatever reactions are coming on her from the husband, it won't affect her because she's engaged in Krishna's service. It cannot touch her. Would a husband get some of her good qualities, devotional service? Oh, definitely. The husband will benefit from the wife. You will get a lot of benefit just by that association with the wife. So it is a service that the wife is a devotee and serving a Catholic husband is a service actually in one sense of the husband. Okay. It's a service actually if the wife is a wife study uh -huh. practicing and her husband is not by marrying such a husband, the wife actually the wife actually benefiting the husband is a kind of service to the fallen condition soul as a husband. In that manner, 
uh, getting married to a non devotee husband is also indirectly uh, anyata sukriti for the husband. Because we, we, we are saying this because we have many devotees sometimes they marry non devotee spouse. So how do we, you know, Yes, well, but at the same time, we don't like to encourage all the girls to go and get married to non-devotees. Because if that happens, you know, the girls themselves are not so strong that they can maintain their Krishna consciousness. So some girls, they go off and they get married to a non-devotee and they give up Krishna consciousness. Because their, their husband's not a devotee, so they don't feel any purpose in practicing Krishna consciousness and they don't have the strength on their own to do it on their own and so they go off into Maya, into the material world. So we don't encourage girls to get married to non devotees It's definitely risky, very risky to associate with a non devotee somebody who is not chanting. So, how will she chant? Somebody is a meat eater, maybe they'll be having meat at home. The husband wants to go out, you can't go out with him, he's going to eat meat. So many problems. Same for the husband getting married a uh, karmic wife. So oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, definitely. The husband marries a woman who's not a devotee. Then how will he eat? <laughs> what will he? He cook himself. He cook himself. Yeah. Well, oh, some men do it. Some men do it, but not every man can. And then you have children. The mother wants to feed the children meat. Feed them non-veg. So many problems. So, yeah, I mean, better that they both have similar lifestyles. If the lifestyles are different, then it will be very difficult moving together. What to speak of eating, even other habits like recreation and so on. If their habits are different, then difficult to get or to live together or work together. Uh -huh. Maharaj, I want to ask you one question. There are couples who are married, you know, yeah, but they are devotees. Okay, after maybe 10 years of marriage and then they head towards divorce. Why, what is the reason for that? But they are devotees, practicing 16 rounds, following the four regulative principles, you know, and having children, two, three children, and then they get married again. Okay. They go into divorce. What can be the cause of it? Different activities. Well, there's definitely something wrong. You say that devotees and they're following everything, but I wonder, really, I don't think it's really possible. If they're going to divorce, there's definitely something wrong somewhere. They're not doing, there's something wrong. Otherwise, they wouldn't divorce like that. Because this question, I will, well, I will always ask uh, Kalisha Prabhu. You know, there are a lot of cases. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of cases, yeah, but this, uh, these people are not practicing Krishna consciousness very seriously. They're, they're doing like that. There's something wrong. They're, they must be doing something wrong, which is not proper. Otherwise, they wouldn't go to the world. Even if, not as if it proves you do correctly, even one doing correctly, there won't be divorce anyway, if you want correctly. So both is actually at fault, in a sense. Right? Mm -hmm. Right, says, if you follow strictly, even though they may dislike each other's nose or hair or anything, after 10 years of marriage they found out, they will still tolerate and they will still proceed because 
there's no divorce in devotee community and if they are devotee, they somehow or other they should tolerate each other and continue until at the time where he can leave home and take one of us from. Well, sometimes it does happen, you know, that because the husband's not a devotee, that, so he gets involved with another woman, you see? And then uh, although the, woman, the, the wife is practicing very strictly, but the husband's not. And the husband gets involved with another woman. And then he wants to go to the other woman, wants to leave his wife. So that happens. So those are the kind of things which, you yeah. know, because people go out to work, you have women working as well. And women are working, they're associating with men, you know, in the corporate world, working in offices and like that. The women are working with the men. And it happens, a lot of contact. If the woman stays at home as a housewife, then it's less likely to happen. The woman's faithful, she's at home, taking care of the family. It's a huge subject in my life. And Hari Lila Prabhu, you know, from my group, he was here last week. So he was trying to help the devotees to understand that marriage is, is forever and not terminated any time they would like. So thank you very much. Okay. Okay, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Sri Prabhupada. Oh, we got some sweets for everybody. This is nice.